now it's time. Um, so welcome to everyone for today's seminar session. So we are having Dr. Katrina Pietekimenez today. So um, as always, you know, I will introduce our speaker and uh, turn the stage over to her. Just before doing that, I uh, just want to remind you, everyone, that the talk will take about 45 minutes. And then you can feel free to drop your questions in the chat box. So we will address them during the Q&A in the final 10 to 15 minutes. Or you can uh, wait until the talk is concluded and unmute yourself and direct your question to our speaker. So um, today we have Dr. Katrina Piete Jimenez, who is a professor in the mathematics department at Central Michigan University and is a co-PI on her institution's NSF Advanced Adaptation Grant. And Dr. Piete Jimenez earned her BS in mathematics from the University of California at Santa Barbara in 1999 and her PhD in mathematics and mathematics education from the University of Arizona in 20, 20, 2004. Sorry. Dr. Piatek Jimenez's research focuses on issues related to equity in STEM education and the STEM workforce, especially issues related to gender. In her role at Central Michigan University, she teaches courses in both mathematics and mathematics education, advises and mentors undergraduate and graduate students, and has held multiple leadership positions. Dr. Piotr Kimenez's favorite course to teach is an undergraduate course she created titled Women in STEM Fields, which she teaches every fall. So now uh, I'm giving the stage to Dr. Katrina Piete Jimenez, and whenever you are ready. Great, fantastic. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so thank you all for coming to my, to my presentation today. And as you can see on my opening slide, I'm gonna be talking about undergraduate physics students' experiences, exploring the impact of underrepresented identities. And this is not going to the next slide. Oh, there we go. Um, so I want to start my presentation with a little bit of background information about myself and how I got to uh, presenting uh, the topic of this talk. So as it was already shared, I'd, I earned my PhD in mathematics slash math education from the University of Arizona in 2004. So um, at the University of Arizona in their mathematics department, graduate students will earn a dissertation in math, or I'm sorry, earn a PhD in math, um, but can write dissertations either in pure mathematics or math education, and my emphasis was math education. And my dissertation's title was Undergraduate Mathematics Students' Understanding of Mathematical Statements and Proofs. So you, you might notice that here, my topic of my dissertation was vastly different than what I'm going to be sharing with you today. And so I want to share with you how I went from being interested in students' understanding of proof and the language of mathematics to being interested in the types of equity work that I do. So when I was doing my dissertation work and I was interviewing um, undergraduate students, I was specifically interviewing students who were in an introduction to proofs course. And these students, um, the, the professor of the course often talked to the students and said, the purpose of this course is to teach you how to be a mathematician, how to um, talk like a mathematician, speak like a mathematician, behave like a mathematician. So that he kept saying this was the purpose of the course. So when I was interviewing the participants uh, for my study, one question I asked them was, do you see yourself as a mathematician or a future mathematician or a mathematician in training, right? And what I found really interesting was the women uh, who I interviewed had very interesting responses. Many of them said, no, I don't see myself as a mathematician, or they might say, yes, but. And regardless whether they, say, they said no or yes, but, their response was always kind of like, yes, but that's not the only thing I identify as. Or yes, but I don't see myself as like a stereotypical mathematician. Or yes, but, or no, I don't because I have so many interests and I'm good at lots of things and I don't want mathematics to be what defined me. And so even back then, um, 20 years ago, this semester actually was when I finished my doctorate, um, I started thinking about some of these issues, about why the women in my study had a different kind of response to um, whether or not they identified as a mathematician. 
So uh, fast forward a few years, and you can see that uh, my research agenda has shifted uh, quite a bit. Um, for a while, I started really focusing on undergraduate women in mathematics, and in particular, what motivated women to study mathematics at the undergraduate level, and whether or not they continued in mathematics beyond the undergraduate level. Um, but also, uh, a lot of my research led to me looking at images of mathematicians and what were some of those stereotypes and how did that affect people? And then also career choice. So how did any of this affect uh, people's future career choices? Um, then uh, in 2019, my university adopted a new gen ed requirement. Uh, called Studies and Discrimination. And I do want to make it clear that this was separate from an already existing requirement on studies in racism and cultural diversity. So already our university had a requirement that every student for graduation needed to take a course in racism or cultural diversity. However, in 2019, we adopted a second um, requirement that said that they need to do both a course in racism and another course in other forms of discrimination. And that could be gender discrimination, sexuality, disability, lots of different um, things, but it, we wanted them to have at least two courses, one in racism and one in a different type of discrimination. And um, at the time I was already serving on the Women and Gender Studies Council at my institution. And a number of colleagues really encouraged me to create a course in the math department that would fit this new gen ed requirement. So I created a cross-listed course. So it has both the designator uh, MTH for math and WGS for Women and Gender Studies. So students can sign up for it under either. And um, it's the 104 course that uh, was mentioned earlier, the Women in STEM Fields course. And I've now taught that course every fall since, uh, since the fall of 2019. So I tell you all of this because the work I'm presenting today actually was done in collaboration with two very impressive undergraduate students here at CMU. Uh, Dakota Kebelbeck, who is currently a physics PhD student at the Colorado School of Mines, and Cielo Medina Medina, who is now a software engineer at Dematic Keon Group here in Michigan. And basically they were both students in my Math 104, my Women in STEM Fields course a few semesters ago. Um, and Dakota, I said, very impressive student. Um, it was kind of interesting. He actually was the only man enrolled in the course that semester out of about 25 students. And that's actually not typical. I normally have a handful of men in the course, but that single semester, he happened to be the only one. Um, and he actually reached out to me prior to the beginning of the semester just to let me know he was signing up for my course. He was really excited about it. He had just found this course in, um, in the course book and said, you know, as a white man who's going in physics, he recognizes a lot of privileges that he has. And he was really excited about taking a course on women in STEM fields um, because he wanted to learn more about what are some of the experiences others end up facing, others with different social identities. And then halfway through the semester, he reached out to me and said, hey, Dr. PJ, which is what my students call me. Hey, Dr. PJ, I would really like to do an undergraduate research project with you where we could look at the experiences of students in the physics department and look at it based on social identities. And um, I found that impressive for many reasons. One, Dakota was already a physics PhD, or I'm sorry, a physics student, and he was already doing undergraduate research in physics with a professor in the physics department. And that was the path he was hoping to take for his PhD and is taking is doing experimental physics. But he was so passionate about what he was learning in the class, he felt like he wanted to firsthand experience collecting data and listening to people's stories and not just read other people's research on it, but conduct the research himself. And um, to be honest, at the time I had already promised myself I was gonna put nothing else on my plate because I was already so overcommitted, but I just could not tell this fantastic student no because he was so excited about it. Um, so then Dakota and I met and talked about it. We ended up bringing Cielo into the project as well. She was another physics student who was taking the Women in STEM Fields course at the same time. And she was definitely a very, um, outspoken person and shared a lot of her perspective during class. And so we thought it would be good to bring her into the project as well. And so then the three of us became a team and conducted the work that I will be presenting today. So I'm now going to go ahead and uh, start sharing a little bit about this work. So I'm going to start with kind of an introduction and some background information about um, 
about the literature. So as you may already know, women and people of color have been historically underrepresented in many of the STEM fields. Uh, the research literature suggests that many different reasons that contribute to this underrepresentation. One particular contributing factor appears to be the unwelcoming culture within many STEM disciplines, including physics. So here, there are lots of resources that, and, and, and uh, literature that talks about this, but I've included one that's about STEM in general, and then one about physics specifically for both of these. Um, and then this can also affect students' development of STEM identities. Again, here's a reference for STEM in general and physics in particular. Um, so while substantial research has been conducted over the years to better understand women and people of color's experiences in physics, few studies have been conducted to understand the experiences of members of other underrepresented groups or those who live at the intersection of multiple underrepresented identities. So a lot of work on women, a lot of work on people of color, but there's other underrepresented identities that just haven't been looked at in detail. What I'll share with you now is a couple of um, studies that have started to branch out that way. So for example, more recently, there's a research team that has begun investigating women of color. So combining women and people of color or LGBTQ plus women in physics and how the intersection of these identities affect their collegiate experience. And I've uh, cited one of their papers, but the same team has written a number of papers on this work. Um, the work of these scholars focuses primarily on investigating physics identity. And they found that some students may either fragment or integrate certain parts of their identities in physics settings in order to avoid negative outcomes or to be able to interact with certain peers. So they've had to adjust their identities when they're in physics settings. There's another research study that was done for relatively recently that was quantitative in nature. And they actually looked at the experiences of professionals in STEM and they utilized the intersection of gender, race, sexuality, and disability status. And so what they actually did was collected that information on a large number of STEM professionals and they created 32 intersectional groups. Um, so in other words, they looked at you know, if somebody was underrepresented in gender and race, but not sexuality and disability, that would be one group. Or if they were underrepresented in gender, race, and sexuality, but not disability would be another group. So that's how they came up with their 32 different groups. And they found that those in the category of white, able-bodied, heterosexual men did experience intersectional privilege, providing them with more social inclusion, professional respect, and career opportunities, more so than individuals in any of the other 31 intersectional categories. So um, I found that very fascinating that if anybody had hit any one of those or multiple of those underrepresented groups, um, there was a distinct difference between them and the people who were in the white, able-bodied, heterosexual male group. Um, so for our study, we wanted to better understand the experiences of undergraduate physics students with varying underrepresented identities. And throughout my talk, I'm going to use this um, notation of URIs to represent underrepresented identities. Um, and we wanted to include ones that were not traditionally considered. So we did include the ones I've already mentioned, um, but also international student status, low socioeconomic status, and first generation college student status were also um, underrepresented identities. And when I say underrepresented identities, I'm not necessarily only talking by numbers, but also by privilege and, and power in our society. Um, so our research questions were as follows. We asked, what challenges do undergraduate students face when pursuing a degree in physics? And that's just a general, what challenge do all undergraduate students face kind of a thing. And then which of these challenges are unique to or compounded for individuals with underrepresented identities? And then also how are these challenges experienced by individuals with specific underrepresented identities or who live at the intersection of multiple underrepresented identities? Um, so for our methods, the data for this study were collected from a large public university within the United States. The physics department at this institution offers both undergraduate and graduate degrees, including a doctoral degree in physics. Excuse me. And the participants for this study were undergraduate students enrolled as physics majors at this university. So to recruit our participants, we obtained a list from the university of all 30 undergraduate students who were declared physics majors at the institution at the time of the study. So there were only 30 people who were registered as undergraduate uh, physics majors. On this list, 
Nine were labeled as female in the university's computer system, and the remaining 21 were labeled as male. And I am going to point out right now, I'm using the phrasing labeled as female, labeled as male, and I recognize, our team recognizes um, the, the complication with that, and that um, at the time, our university only allowed people to be labeled by the binary as female or male, and I believe they only collected information about uh, sex at birth. And so we acknowledge the the problematic nature of the university's commu uh, computer system, but that was the data that we could gather at that point in time. Um, four of the undergraduate majors were labeled as racial or ethnic minorities in the computer system, and the remaining 26 were labeled as white. Um, and so in particular, when you looked at the 30 majors, 18 of the 30 majors, which is 60% of them, were labeled as white males. So in order to ensure a diverse group of participants for this study, we actually sent an invitation to all 12 of the physics majors who were labeled in the system as either female or a racial minority. So we invited all 12 of those people. And then we also randomly selected a subset of physics majors who were labeled as white males in the system and sent them an invitation also inviting them to participate as well. And in the end, we ended up with 11 students who chose to participate in our study. Uh, we conducted a series of two in-depth interviews with each participant. So the length of the interviews ranged from 26 minutes to 115 minutes each. And I would say a typical interview was right around 80 minutes. And the interviews were audio recorded and transcribed and later analyzed. Um, we also collected demographic data from the participants through a very detailed uh, questionnaire. So this was actually emailed to them prior to their interviews and asked them to fill out the information on the questionnaire. Of our 11 participants in the study, four identified as women, five identified as men, and two identified as non-binary. Uh, four of the participants identified as racial or ethnic minority. Uh, the other underrepresented identities, we had one student who identified as having international student status, uh, four who identified as having underrepresented sexual orientation, five who called uh, considered themselves first-generation college students, uh, three who identified as low socioeconomic status, one who identified with a physical disability, and two who identified with a learning disability. So we had quite a range of underrepresented identities amongst our participants. Um, all of the participants were between the ages of 18 and 22, so they all were what we might consider traditional undergraduate students. And our participants ranged from having zero underrepresented identities to five. So we had two participants with zero underrepresented identities, and we had one participant who had five and a bunch in between. Um, so with regards to coding, initial codes were developed inductively by the researchers, by our team, uh, based on the themes we identified within the transcripts. So we started by reading through a number of transcripts and looking for different themes that we and, and different themes came out at us. And then once we created some initial codes, then we coded the interviews. We made sure that there were, we had at least two people code um, each interview, and it was it, the variety of us, but two of us coded each interview. And then throughout the process, we would then compare the codes. And if we ever disagreed on a code, then we would bring the third researcher into the discussion and um, reconcile any disagreements together as a team. So that's how we approached that process. Um, okay. Uh, so first I'm gonna start by sharing some of our general results, our general challenges that were expressed by all participants. Uh, we identified five main categories within the data which were difficult course content, pedagogy and assessments, competitive environment, lack of community, and then lack of mentorship. However, for this talk, I'm only gonna talk on the three that are bolded here, just due to time, I wouldn't be able to go into depth on all of the categories. So I picked the three that I thought was um, most relevant to share. So I'll start right now talking a little bit about pedagogy and assessment. So our participants talked about the following things, the fast paced nature of their physics courses, how they felt that the quantity of the content covered in one course was way more than a reasonable person could handle. Um, the use of oral exams, multiple professors seem to use oral exams within their courses in the physics department, uh, the lack of homework assigned and the grading schemes used by physics professors. 
And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to share some quotes, direct quotes from our participants, because sometimes I think it helps a, um, a lot to hear the students' voices. So here's one quote by Floyd, who has zero URI, so he has no underrepresented identities. And he says, I would say even to this day, course is the hardest physics class and the hardest class I have ever taken in college that demanded a lot. It didn't help that we had oral exams, just like our entire grade depended on essentially, uh, yeah, that was, I did learn some cool, interesting material from it. Like I did actually learn the subject material, but the professor just went so fast that learning it was all very difficult. And then just the amount that he demanded you to know, like a moment's notice, specifically on the oral exam was terrifying. Okay, so here you can see them talking about difficulty of the content, the, the amount of content covered in one semester, the oral exam. So a lot of that is wrapped up into this one quote. Here's another quote by another participant. And Dolly says, I'm taking course. It is very in, a very interesting class. We're not following the textbook too closely. We're kind of jumping all over the place. There are no homework assignments at all. The professor doesn't even assign us problems. Well, he kind of does. He'll say, maybe look at look at problem 3.5 of the text or something like that. But that's only, in, only it in terms of homework. The grades we have in the class are through exams. That's the only feedback we're getting. So it's interesting because Dolly was one of many participants who talked about wanting homework assigned in the class. And it was interesting because while some of the participants said, I really wish my professor would sign homework grade it or collect it, grade it and hand it back to me to give me feedback. And then other participants would say, I wish they'd assign us problems. I don't want them to collect it. I don't want them to grade it, but just assign us problems so we can practice and see, do we know what we're doing or not? So there was certainly not consensus amongst the participants on whether or not they would want it collected and graded, but multiple, multiple participants talked about wanting to be able to be assigned homework so that they can get feedback other than just their test. And then here's another quote uh, by a participant, Eleanor. Eleanor says, it sucks that so many physics classes, like everyone does bad on exams and everyone said that and I believed them. But then when I started doing bad on exams, it's like, oh God, this sucks. Like seeing you get a 50% on an exam and then knowing that you're at the, like at the top of this class, it's like, this is, there's something wrong here. This is not, like something needs to be fixed. And I don't want to go through that again. I don't want to have to see a 50% on an exam. Like, I don't, I don't need to see that, right? So what Eleanor is expressing is, is that basically the exams that were written were written so hard that even the top students are getting around 50% on the exam. And then the professors go back and curve the grade substantially. So she might get a 50% on an exam and then end up with an A in the class. But it, that, lots of students talked about this. It made them feel dumb and it made them feel like they weren't capable. And it was very frustrating. And actually Eleanor, at the time of the interviews, she had been a double major in math and physics. And at the time of the interviews, she had just decided to drop her physics major and be a math major only. And she often talked about her experiences being very different between the two departments. But here, this is why she's saying, I don't want to have to see that. Like I'm done being a physics major because I don't need to go through what I'm having to go through in my physics courses. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about lack of community, which was another one of the categories that we found. Um, so all nine participants in our study who had underrepresented identities discussed there being a lack of community within the department. Um, many of them felt disconnected from the physics faculty, but there was also um, a lack of community they talked about amongst the physics majors as well. Um, and there's not a lot of physics majors, right? There was 30 at the university, so maybe seven or eight per um per class level. Um, but what we also find important to note is that the two participants that we had with zero underrepresented identities never talked about there being a lack of community. And I will fully acknowledge we only had two participants with zero URIs. So that might be unique to those two participants, but it was certainly noteworthy that all of the ones who had underrepresented identities did talk about this and the two who didn't, didn't bring it up. So here's a quote, another quote from Eleanor where she says, I don't feel like I was really encouraged or discouraged. I feel like the pro professors really, I don't want to say that they didn't care, but they, well, it kind of felt like they didn't care. Like, I don't know. I feel like they always said that they cared and I think they believed themselves. I don't think they're lying, 
but I also don't think they're actively that they actively did things to make me feel like I was cared for at all. So that was Eleanor's perspective. Here's another quote from Cleo. Cleo says, I have barely talked to professors outside the class, with the exception of course last semester. I got help with the homework, but other than that, I just don't, because I don't, I'm not used to talking to professors or teachers, and I don't know how to do it. So I would rather ask my peers first, and then if that doesn't work, just not do it, which isn't the way to go about things, but I just don't know how to talk to professors. And like, they all kind of scare me just a little bit, right? So what Cleo is talking about here is that Cleo felt like they didn't know how to talk to their professors. And if they got stuck with the actual content in the course, they would try going to their peers. And if their peers couldn't help them, they would just give up on the content. So while this is a lack of community and showing kind of what we call an environmental or a cult, uh, uh, the culture of the department or environmental concern, there's also, it affects her academics as well because she doesn't feel comfortable talking to the professors. It affected her academically where she wouldn't learn the content as well as she could otherwise. Um, many participants actually also talked about a lack of community amongst their peers, which I mentioned as well. Um, and what we found interesting was this most often was discussed by those with the most number of URIs. So Asher, um, our participant with five URIs, said during their interview, I'm going to be quite honest. I was of the opinion sophomore year that like all of you hated me. And when Asher is saying all of you, they mean all of you, my peers in, in physics. Um, and so this was probably the most strong um, statement that one of the, uh, the participants made. But again, a lot of uh, the participants talked about not feeling like they fit in with their peers, not being um, invited to do study groups or hang out with other people. So was, there was definitely that, that disconnect. And we noticed it most with the participants with the more number of, of underrepresented identities. So now I wanna talk a little bit about lack of mentorship. Um, five participants talked about wishing they had more mentoring regarding their path as a physics major, like what course to take next or how to approach the senior research project or things like that. And four participants discussed not knowing what to do with their degree post-graduation. Like, I know I'm a physics major, but now what? Um, so here's a, a quote from Cleo who says, mostly I'd like just a little bit more guidance with how to work with your way through the major and like specifically toward the end senior project stuff. Like graduation, guidance toward grad school if that's what you wanna do. Maybe like better setting of expectations with freshmen on how often you should meet with your department advisor. Just like give me a handout for me to keep to hold on to for the four years so I remember, right? So this quote by Cleo hits, I feel all of this, right? Cleo's talking a little bit about wanting guidance through the major, what courses to take, the senior project, which is a senior research project, guidance for what to do afterwards regarding grad school. And if you remember a few quotes ago, um, I quoted Cleo where Cleo was saying that she's just not comfortable talking with her professors or approaching her professors. And so when she says here, I wish freshman year, I was told how often to go see my department advisor. I think what she's kind of trying to get at is if she knows it's appropriate to meet with her advisor every semester, she would do that. If she knew it was something that she was supposed to do once a year, she would do that. But because she wasn't given guidance on how often to meet with her advisor, she's kind of hesitant and not really sure how to approach it. Um, so one thing I wanna share with mentorship is that we find it really important to note that two, the two students with zero URIs, when they talked about mentorship, they only had concerns with what to do after graduation. Like, what do I do now with my degree? Should, what are good graduate schools to apply for? Things like that where the participants who expressed that they had inadequate mentoring within the major, or they had concerns about both with the major and post-graduation, those were all uh, participants who had at least one underrepresented identity. So now what I wanna talk about is, so those were kind of our general challenges that we found, but we also looked specifically at what were challenges that were compounded by specific identities. So um, when students, participants said, well, because of this identity that I have, this made it harder. Those are the kinds of things we're looking at it now. So while all 11 participants talked about having these general challenges, eight of the nine participants that had underrepresented identities 
um, talked about challenges specific to at least one of those underrepresented identities. So I'm gonna share some quotes uh, now regarding that. So the first few I'm gonna talk a little bit about first generation college students. So for example, Dolly says, I guess me sort of being a first generation college student and not necessarily having the background of how universities work. So basically Dolly was talking a lot about like, I don't know what to do here at college. I don't know how to do certain things and other people have parents or things who can give them advice on that. And she just didn't have access to those kinds of resources. Here's another quote by Deacon, which is kind of similar, a, a first generation college student, where Deacon says, so not only was I the first of the very few in my family to go to the university, I was the only one going into a science field. You know what I mean? So there was a bit of stress there because part of me would just want to make everybody happy, you know, going into the university. And I wanted to show people that I could do it. And what I find interesting is Deacon was not the only first generation college student who talked about, they might've had a cousin or somebody else who had been to college, but nobody else that was in college that was also studying science. And they saw because of different stresses and different um, levels of expectation of the science majors, that this made being a first generation college student even harder for them. Um, the next quote is a student who identifies as both first generation and low socioeconomic status. And shortly before uh, this quote, piece of the quote, he's talking about his first generation uh, status, but then he also brings into low socioeconomic status as well. He says, coming from a school that was like the highest class, <clears throat> excuse me, we had was like pre-calc. That was a little, a little hard, but then like going into college and realizing, oh, well, we still gotta like, I mean, I guess I could start with Calc 1, but I definitely should just try and redo a little bit of things, get used to being in college. So, and I think that's one thing. Some people don't like realize making the jump. It was a lot harder. So first Carter was talking about being first generation, not knowing, but then also he talked about how his high school was not well funded because he was from a low socioeconomic uh, area. And so because they were not well funded, they didn't have high quality classes. And he goes on talking a little bit more about how others of his peers had already had calculus in high school, but because of his uh, uh, low socioeconomic background that he didn't even have that option prior to getting to college. So now he had multiple things that he was trying to balance. Um, and then we had two participants who had different uh, disabilities. And so here's a quote from Brooklyn who says, in the disability aspect as well, I think it's definitely a conundrum in the science aspect that if you are here, you're expected to be smart and you're expected to just put up with a lot of things, especially in like our physics department. There's a lot of things that are kind of like, oh, can we just like, you know, wave that off? Um, and in the context of the interview, we interpret Brooklyn as basically talking about how our institution has different um, uh, accommodations for individuals with disabilities. Students with disabilities can have extra time on tests or potentially extra time for assignments or have note takers or things like that. And what Brooklyn is saying here is that some of her physics professors were kind of like, can we just not worry about that and just have you sit in class and take the test with everybody else? Like not wanting to give her the accommodations that by law she deserves. Um, and it's really fascinating because she's talking about it specifically in the context of her physics courses. Um, and as a, a student, she takes lots of gen ed courses and other things, and she's not feeling that same um, expectation of wanting to just wave that off in her other courses and other disciplines. Uh, oh, I think I just went the wrong direction or I went too fast there. Okay, so here is Asher. Um, Asher is also a student who has disability and says physics and astronomy, the way they're currently taught is that they are so fast paced. I learn really slowly, like I have to take my time and that's because I have a learning disorder. So it takes me significantly longer amount of time just to read a chapter of the book, let alone understand the information and be able to do something with it. So physics is hard on its own. Adding a learning disability on top of it makes it even worse. So Asher, a lot of the students talked about how fast paced and hard uh, the content was. 
And Asher's saying, and by throwing a learning disability into that as well, it's just that much harder for them. Um, we also had students who talked about being um, being a woman or their gender as being problematic um, in the physics major. So here's a quote from Eleanor who says, I do think that obviously with women, there's less representation. As I said, we don't have any female professors, no one to look up to as a lady. And I don't know, like it did come to a point because I mean, obviously a lot of my friends are male just because I was a physics major and most of the friends you can make are men. And there were times where I'd be just be like, oh, I want some good lady time. Like I want some good lady friends. So it, she just felt very isolated at times. Like she just didn't fit. Um, and she just was, was missing something. Uh, participants also talked about their sexuality as being um, a, a barrier for them at times. Cleo talks about, she says this, um, all of us are ultimately white. So then there's just stuff like other hidden stuff that's not race, like queer stuff. But like, no one is going to talk about that in class. It was only relatively recently that I had found out that more of the people in the major are queer. And I was like, what? And I was like at a party at one of their apartments and like none of us have mentioned it again. And I find this very powerful as well, because actually when we did the, the interviews, we actually out of our 11 participants, I think I think it was four who identified as being a member of the LGBT, LGBTQ community. And so that that was a decent percentage. So she's saying that there are other people, but I didn't know. So it's a shame that that she didn't know. Um, but also once they all found out that they that there were others who were members of that community at this party, they now go back to the physics classroom and pretend like it never happened and like they don't know. Um, and so I just found that very sad. Um, and then here's Asher, a quote from Asher talking about their multiple underrepresented identities and how those play a role in them. And Asher says, because physics is not a woman friendly science. And back then I was identified as a woman, but it's also not an LGBTQ friendly science. And it's really not a disabled friendly science. And so I, and I think this is the most important part with this question too, is there are no other professors like me in this department. So Asher, again, just did not feel like they fit in with the professors and that the professors, Asher talks about how the professors just don't understand what she is or what they are going through. So um, I'm now to the part of the discussion of, so what do we make of all this data? Um, so all of our participants experienced challenges while pursuing a degree in physics. The main uh, general categories that some of them I talked about today, some I didn't were difficult content, pedagogy and assessments, competitive environment, lack of community, and lack of mentorship. Um, when considering each of these categories separately, we noted that many of the categories involve both academic challenges and environmental challenges within the same category, and that these two types of challenges were not mutually exclusive. So for example, the students who discussed pedagogical and assessment choices made by their professors, um, they often started talking them about it as a challenge that affected them academically, but it also affected the tone of the environment in which they studied and learned. So because the professors wrote these tests that were un, un, um, unrealistic for the undergraduates to do, and it was people were getting at highest 50% on their tests, then that affected that environment and the tone of where they were like, like I don't wanna do this. I'm tired, I'm tired of getting, feeling like I'm getting beat up by, by these courses. Um, and also the other way around, when people talked about the environment of not knowing how to approach their professors, not feeling like they fit in with the professors, then it meant that academically they didn't have access to those professors to help them with their content. Um, so therefore, our findings suggest that the general challenges experienced by physics majors are both academic and environmental in nature. And furthermore, that these two types of challenges, academic and environmental, are likely to impact each other. Um, although we found that all of our participants did face some challenges while pursuing their physics major, it was very clear that those with underrepresented identities expressed having more challenges than those without. And in fact, it really seemed that the more uh, underrepresented identities a participant identified with, the more challenges they seemed to encounter.
Um, one notable result is that only students with underrepresented identities discussed their feelings of not belonging amongst their peers and stated that there being a lack of community within the department. And furthermore, the students with underrepresented identities expressed different concerns regarding mentorship. So while participants with underrepresented identities felt that they had inadequate mentoring from their faculty on multiple accounts, uh, those with no underrepresented identities only had concerns with what to do after graduation. Moreover, many challenge, uh, challenging experiences were directly tied to participants with certain underrepresented identities or at the intersection of multiple identities. Um, and while I just said we can't pull apart academic versus environmental, normally uh, academic challenges were brought up at least by uh, participants having uh, a disability, being a first generation college student or coming from low socioeconomic status. So they might've started in that context and moved to environmental. Um, but environmental challenges were most uh, brought up initially from people who were um, identified as a woman or a member of the LGBTQ plus community. What we found really interesting is that no specific challenges were noted in the context of race and ethnicity. So none of our participants talked about their, uh, their racial or ethnic identity as causing them um, challenges. Uh, but it, that might be partly in the, the context of the participants that we had. We did have an African-American participant. We did have a, La a Latino participant. Um, but both of them often talked about their um, first generation college student status or low socioeconomic status. And so it's possible that they were focusing more on those parts of their identity as opposed to race or ethnicity in their, in their conversations with us. Uh, when considering the specific underrepresented identities of all our participants, one distinction we found um, important was that many of our participants who were either members of the LGBT BTQ plus community or who had disabilities often referred to these as what they called hidden identities. In other words, these were identities that they saw as greatly affecting their experiences as individuals and as physics students on a regular basis. Yet they were also identities that they could kind of keep hidden from their faculty and their peers if they chose to, which they saw as different from like their gender or their race or ethnicity. Um, in some ways, they saw this as giving them more control over their experience, but in other ways, they saw this as causing them more of a burden, as they didn't always feel they could like bring their full self to the physics classroom. Um, we found this perspective really insightful, and we would like to see this idea of hidden identities explored by research more deeply in the future. Um, and then finally, we know that our participants who are living at the intersection of multiple underrepresented identities discussed being um, it being difficult to navigate multiple underrepresented identities at one time, and that this compounded their lack of belonging. They didn't feel, fit like they feel like they fit in this group, but they also didn't feel like they fit in that. Um, so some concluding thoughts. Uh, research has shown that these experiences are not unique to our participants and have been reported by other individuals in STEM where the more underrepresented identities a person has, the more discrimination, isolation, and harassment they have encountered. Um, environments like the ones described by members of these groups uh, make it exceedingly difficult for them to feel welcomed and included and make it challenging for them to identify potential allies. Um, and we believe it's important for faculty and STEM departments to really understand these experiences of students with underrepresented identities and to consciously work to be more welcoming and to understand how their pedagogical choices affects different, affect different students differently. Um, because as we noted, right, the fast paced nature of the courses or the oral exams or things like that can definitely affect students with different um, identities differently. So here's a quick slide of my references. Um, and thank you very much for listening to my talk. Thank you so much. This was very insightful. And now I'm going to um, open the stage for questions. And I'm going to also uh, monitor chats. So feel free to unmute yourself and ask your questions. OK, so I see in the chat, what differentiations have you seen in the treatment of female versus male multicultural multiple identity students pursuing advanced degrees in physics? Great, good question. Um, so um, 
it was actually both our um, participants uh, who were, um, so we had four who identified as racial minorities, African-American, um, uh, Latino, and then we also had a student who was Asian and Middle Eastern. And so, so you might say that Asian and Middle Eastern are not necessarily underrepresented in the STEM fields overall. So that's a, that's a conversation some people have. Um, but they certainly were underrepresented within our um, within our within our physics department amongst faculty and other students. Um, but what? Uh, so so the reason I'm bringing this up is because the two participants who identified as African American and who identified as Latino were both um, identified as men. Um, and so it, it was interesting because they they really talked a lot about their their um, being first generation college students and their low socioeconomic status. And so that seemed to play a bigger role, whereas our participants who identified as female or non-binary, because um, we had two participants who were non-binary, both who were assigned female at birth, um, th those identities of being female or non-binary um, played a, a really big role in, in, um, in their conversations with us. Uh, one of the participants who identifies as non-binary talked about how one of their professors refused to get their pronouns correctly um, and things like that. Um, so we definitely saw that the participants who, had, uh, who identified as women or non-binary and had all of these other uh, experiences, it just felt like they just felt like they were drowning to a much uh, deeper level than the participants who identified as male. I don't know if that answered the question. Um, hopefully it did. The next question I see says, were there, by the way, um, I, I am a parent of a child who's dyslexic. So I'm very conscientious about that. And so this is partly why I do read my slides because I realize that there are people with different dis with different abilities out there. And so I think it's important that I read my slides for people who have different abilities. And I also will be reading out the questions as well. So were there any department policies that seemed to fall through the cracks that provided support for students in, uh, in physics majors? During the interviews, uh, were there questions to the students on how they think the support could improve to ensure graduation in the physics field? If so, what were some examples um, on what you gathered in the interviews? Great question. And yes, yes, yes. Um, the, the, the students, we definitely talked with them about it. They, uh, they made lots of suggestions to us, whether or not uh, we solicited the suggestions, they certainly wanted to provide us um, with ideas. Um, there's one particular course that they felt was just above and beyond more um, challenging and way more content than any other course. And they highly recommended breaking it into two courses. Um, they felt that they would really like to see like a freshman level course on what to do with a physics major, like that kind of a course um, where they could learn early on, like what are their opportunities and what like what are different things that they can do post-graduation and then um, kind of maybe ha have invited speakers come and talk about their experiences. Um, they talked about um, wanting there to be more kind of collegial um, events where, where faculty and, and students could talk on a more casual level and that they could, they talked about, and this, this was one of their terms, but kind of wanting more human kind of mentoring where they felt like the professors almost positioned themselves as such experts and different from them that they felt like we just, we want them to treat us like we're real people. We want them to understand what our lives are like. Um, one of our participants shared a story. This is Asher who has five underrepresented identities, shared a story of when they were in this one professor's office at one point and said to the professor, um, and who does your laundry? Who does your cooking? Um, and said, you have a wife at home, and I know that, who is doing all of that stuff. Um, I have to do it all for myself, in addition to working full time while being a student in order to pay my bills. Like, Asher really had this moment with this professor. But then Asher talks about how after that, um, they actually developed almost a friendship with that professor. Like, it took that breakdown and her crying in his office and really calling him out on it. But then she ended up, or they ended up saying that um, 
they develop this relationship with the professor and the professor's like, I will do what I can to help you get through this semester. Like, let, let's talk, let's work this out. Right. Um, and, and it seems it seems that a student shouldn't have to go through such a um, kind of a traumatic experience to be able to get that kind of support. So those are some of the things um, that I that and, and, and I will say that we wrote up a report for the department faculty um, on on some of these results and um, what some of the the students suggestions were and we uh, turn, uh, gave it to the faculty in that department and um, the dean's office also asked and so we checked with their department is it okay if we share it with the dean's office um, but I, I do know that the department has has been considering some of this and I believe they're making some curricular changes based on the suggestions of the students which I think is fantastic. Uh, the next question I Thank see you. is oh yeah sure great thanks. Uh, let's see, the next question I see is, I was recently researching neurodivergence in STEM and found that physics has the highest percentage of neurodivergent individuals. That's interesting. Uh, how do you consider neurodivergence in your studies? I feel that I most often see the quirky physicist or one portrayed as the supervillain in TV shows and movies. Do you feel that these portrayals impact who pursues, pursues physics? Yes, yes, and yes. Um, so I have to admit that most of my work is in math education and like stereotypes of mathematicians. And I'm only now dabbling a little bit into physics. Um, but I think that this is very this is very interesting and true. I know that um, there's a very high percentage of mathematicians who have autism or are along the spectrum as well. Um, so I wonder if um, you know math and physics actually have a lot in common. And so um, so I, I I find that interesting. And I do definitely think that the the quirky physicist or how how different people are portrayed in the media makes a huge effect. Um, a number of years ago, a colleague and I created a course called um, Math uh, Mathematics in the Media. And uh, we actually, in the course, we would spend time watching, it was a three hour course once a week and we would watch movies. Uh, the first movie we'd actually watch uh, every semester was, um, Mean Girls, if you've ever seen that movie. And you might say Mean Girls, but there's a lot of stereotypes about mathematicians and what it means to be good in mathematics and whether or not that's an appropriate thing to be in high school. So we would start, it was a course for people who are going to be teachers, right? So we would start with Mean Girls, but we would watch lots of movies in that course and analyze um, like what what does this mean? Like what are, what are these messages that are being sent out to individuals, and what does that mean for the future of of the, or the face I should say the face of mathematicians? And the same thing would be true for physics. In the women in STEM fields course, we talk a little bit about some of that as well, and we talk about uh, the TV show Big Bang Theory, right, which has mostly physicists and engineers, right, and we talk about how if this is what we're portraying. It, it not only affects people who think about wanting to go into these STEM fields, right? And what, and make, maybe influences their decisions. And actually there's research that suggests that it does influence some decisions. Um, but also once you're in that field, it affects how people treat you, right? Um, and so if people see you in a different study I did with two other undergraduate students a number of years ago, I've, I've had such great um, opportunities to work with phenomenal undergrads. But we actually had college students draw pictures of mathematicians and, and write stories about what they think about with mathematicians and things. Um, but anyway, uh, they often, uh, oh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> but, but this idea of mathematicians fitting these different stereotypes and, and people not necessarily identifying with those stereotypes. And so then not identifying as, as being a mathematician. Um, so, and I, I would say that most likely physics is very much the same way. Great, the next question says, has there been any research on how students having kids and the amount of support from family and friends that affect pursuing any daunting field like math or physics? Ah, very good question as well. Um, not exactly related, but like, Half an hour before this presentation, I downloaded an article I found, and it was about parental, like for women who are double majoring in a STEM field and a non-STEM field, and how parental influenced, how parents influence their decisions. I think it's supposed to be post graduation, like what they, which of which field they end up going to. I haven't read the article; I just downloaded it. But so there is work out there um, that looks at that um, uh, uh, on parents' uh, research, right? Okay. Yeah. 
that was really cool. The, I, I love that you said that you just found one. Um, cause I, I, you know, a lot of people talk and, but they, they talk about, you know, underrepresented and I'm like, well, this is also a factor. It might not be like a social status or something, but it's definitely a factor because I obviously, that's one of my biggest things, um, too. I have other things that, you know, deter me, but this is something that I didn't see, like, do other people feel the same way as I do, um, uh, type of thing. As a deterring thing, as opposed to bringing in, is that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So there is older research that talks about like parents um, encouraging their sons more so than their daughters in STEM fields. But again, that's older research. That makes um, sense. Yeah, I could see that um, in the older. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one thing I would say, I, I'm, a, I'm a parent of two daughters. My girls are uh, 13 and 10, right? And they both um, definitely have a knack for mathematics and science. And so I definitely do whatever I can to support them in that direction, right? Yeah, both, yeah. Both my husband and I are in the STEM fields, right? And it, so yeah. um, I wonder how much that influences as well. Yeah, probably a good bit, because I know I, since I'm more science-based I do portray that on my children as well just naturally so right right oh when they were little kids we'd be driving into town because we lived like 15 minutes out of town and we'd just have these conversations like my daughter would say there's five seats in the car I said yeah and there's three of us in the car right now so how many more people could we fit in the car right like she was <laughs> years old in yeah. school right and then we talked yeah. about oh there's four of us in the family you know, <laughs> one boy and we girls, right? And, but there's also four of us, two adults, two kids. So two plus two is four, <laughs> but one plus three is four, right? So I don't even think- Give me some that. ideas. You gave me some ideas. <laughs> <laughs>
it's not easy for anyone that we all go through challenges and that you're willing to be that support for them and also give them advice on or share with them what, how you handled situations so that they can then use that for their advice. Thank you so much um, for the time's sake. Uh, I have one more question in the chat. If you have time, how can policy changes be used to make this climate more welcoming? Yeah, that's a, that's a tricky one. Um, how can policy changes be made? Because I think that um, you have to change the individuals, so to speak, right? Um, we do, so So in the advanced grant, which is an NSF grant where we, we are working on changing the culture and climate for women, faculty, and STEM. So we definitely have policy changes. There are policies that have been written a long time ago. Um, but then we also are looking at the individual, like climate changes, right? With regards to policy, one thing that a lot of policy research suggests is that the more vague a policy is, the more it allows bias to interfere. Um, and so if you can be more specific and structured in the policy, then it doesn't allow for bias um, as much, right? There's always gonna be some wiggle room for bias, unfortunately, right? But um, so in that respect, but again, I'm thinking more about like promotion and tenure policies or how we assign teaching, um, but maybe how we end up assigning um, tutoring opportunities for our students or things like that. If we have a policy in place that's structured, then it doesn't allow for a professor to say, oh, well, I particularly like this student. I'm going to offer this opportunity to this student. Um, so that's, I guess, what comes to um, off the top of my head. Um, but I think also for the climate, for a lot of the climate things, we do a lot uh, at, at my university of like, implicit bias training workshops and bystander training. Like if you hear or see something that's not okay, how can you appropriately bring it up or, or interject something in the conversation so that the person who said it doesn't just feel attacked and turn their brain off, right? Um, and that the person the comment was made towards doesn't feel like you're acting like you're just coming to the rescue, right? So we're, we're working with a lot of, of that kind of thing. There's a group called Power Play out of the University of New Hampshire, and they do phenomenal work. We've brought them to our campus twice. Um, so I highly recommend Power Play. Thank you so Thank you. much. As we wrap up today's seminar, I want to express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Piate Jimenez for sharing her expertise with us. And your presentation was truly insightful. And I also want to thank each and every one of you for your active participation and bringing your thoughtful questions. And if you have more questions um, and comments to share, feel free to reach out to our speakers. Until next time, take care. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.